Okay, hey, welcome back to our um, second lecture for BC 308, our course on Revelation and Daniel. We have just started Revelation and we are in chapter one. We're just reading through it little by little. So we just read Revelation chapter one, verses four through eight. And uh, what we are seeing in verses 4 and 5, Revelation 1, 4 and 5, is the Godhead. And each person of the Godhead is introduced in a certain way. Right? Obviously, it's not everything who they are, uh, but some things. God the Father, Him who is, who was, who is to come. God the Spirit, seven spirits who are before his throne. But we said here we cannot take number seven literally, it's figurative, representing completeness and perfection. So the Holy Spirit is a complete, perfect Holy Spirit who is in the throne of in the in the throne room. And then the eternal word. He's introduced to us, verse five, he is Jesus Christ. The faithful witness that has reference to his life on earth, on the earth, when the eternal word walked on the earth, he was the faithful witness. That means he never compromised on who and what he spoke. He said, "Only I only speak what my father speaks. I only." do what I see my father do, faithful witness. And he is the firstborn from the dead. First person to be raised from the dead, never to die again. Now we know other people were raised from the dead, but they all died. They went back. They didn't live eternally after. I mean, they, they died. But Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Now, we have to be a little careful about that term firstborn, because uh, it has been misused in the sense, when it says firstborn, it should not be used to say, the first person to be born again. You know, there have been sermons preached that way. Jesus is the first born again man and all of that. No, 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 no. Jesus never needed to be born again. He was always God, right? Uh, we need to be born again because we were in darkness. We are now brought to light. We did not have the life of God. We need the life of God, so we, we need human beings. We need to be born again. Jesus is God, deity, who became man. He bore our sin. He became sin in that sense, but he was God. And when he was raised from the dead, understand when it says first born from the dead, in the sense that he was raised up from the dead, the first person to be raised up from the dead. He died representing us as a man, raised from the dead. Not in the sense of him being born again or receiving you know, uh, eternal life, not in that sense. But he's raised up, never to die again, paving the way for the rest of us to become sons and daughters of God. So we are sons and daughters who are adopted into God's family the Lord Jesus was always part of the Godhead. He was not adopted in any sense. He was part of the Godhead. He walked on the earth as the Son of God in submission to the Father. He was raised from the dead to live eternally, never to die again. So firstborn must not, must not be misinterpreted as the firstborn again, man. No, 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 don't do that. First born is just referring to the fact that he was the first person to be raised from the dead, never to die again, 
paving the way for the rest of us to uh, be raised from the dead. Okay. Uh, Jafina, your question. Yeah, you can hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I also heard an interpretation like first born, where it means like uh, he was the first person to born out of the spirit, like by, by the Holy Spirit. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Uh, would that be a right interpretation in, in any sense? I just wanted to hear it. When it says first born, they say that he's the first one to be born out of the spirit because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's what I believed until now. So, so I just wanted to know if, if that's right. Okay. So I would say uh, we have to be a little careful with that. When the angel came and said to Mary, so Mary said, you know, how am I going to have a baby? Then Gabriel said, the power of the highest, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. And that which is conceived in you, the Holy One, will be the Son of God. So in what sense did Jesus be born of this born by the Holy Spirit in the sense that it was the Holy Spirit who worked in Mary's womb and physical body to give a physical body to this baby, you know, to the baby Jesus. But this does not mean it does not mean that Jesus was created at that time. Because who was this? This was the eternal word taking on human form, human uh, physical form. He's the eternal word. So this Jesus always was there. And it does not mean that he was born of the Spirit in the same way that we are born of the Spirit. Two different things. He was born of the Spirit in the sense that the Holy Spirit caused the womb of womb of Mary to supernaturally conceive a baby and give that form to the eternal word who well, was born there. He was not born of the Spirit in the same way we are born of the Spirit. When we are born again or we are born of the Spirit, our spirit is dead. It does not have the life and the nature of God. In fact, it has a sinful nature. Jesus never had a sinful nature. So when we are born again, the nature of the devil is taken out of us, the sinful nature is taken out of us, and we're given the life and the nature of God. Now that never happened to Jesus because he never had a sinful nature. Right? So when somebody is preaching and saying Jesus was born of the Spirit, understand it carefully that it only means the physical form was created by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. But the Jesus we are talking to was eternal. He was God who became man. He left his powers of deity, of omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence in heaven. He left the glory of the deity. He came as a man. He entered, you can almost think like this eternal God, entered into that physical baby that was being formed in Mary's womb. That physical baby was supernatural by the power of the Holy Spirit. He came into that. But he was not born of the Spirit in the sense that we are born of the Spirit because we move from death to life, which was not the true, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, it's not true about Jesus, right? So uh, I see John's comment, yeah, Colossians 1.15, firstborn, yeah, so wherever the, the, the term firstborn uh, is used about Jesus, you know, all that we just said right now, applies meaning it should be understood as him being the 
uh, the first person to be raised from the dead, or the uh, you know the God who became a man, who is lead, who is a, you know. So we are referred to as the the his brethren. So in that sense, we are we are born again, not he. He is the one who gives us this life. So wherever that term firstborn used in reference to Jesus, it must be very clear. Um, you know everything I just said applies. Um, uh, he is not a born again man. He is God who became man, who rose from the dead to live eternally. We are the ones who are born again, right? So yeah, be careful because uh, in the charismatic church that Jesus being the born again man teaching came out. I think in the I don't know, must be in the 80s or 90s or something. You know, there was that whole teaching going on. It spread all over the world, and but it's you know, it's not right. Yeah, you, you, this is God. You're talking about God who became a man, who was raised from the dead, and so that 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 left a lot of confusion. So we should be careful. Okay. Um. All right. So continuing on in verse five. Uh, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. So the faithful witness, talking about his earthly life, the firstborn from the dead, talking about his resurrection and uh, who he is from there, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, who he is going to be. Right. So uh, he is right now king of kings, a lord of lords, seated and thrown about. But he is going to come and rule on the earth over all the kings and the kingdoms of the earth, literally. Right? And then it continues talking about this eternal word, this Jesus. It says, he, verse 5, continuing, he, loved, he has loved us, he's washed us from our sins in his own blood. He's made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And then, Verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. So the book is beginning with a reference to the grand finale, which is we in Revelation 19, when he comes you know, as, as king, as lord, and John says he comes riding on a white horse, uh, and so uh, the book is beginning with that in mind, saying that's the grand finale that we are going to journey towards. And very interesting, this is actually a quote from Zechariah. So if you turn with me, just keep your hand Revelation 1, we'll cross-reference. So we go to Zechariah 12 and verse 10. Zechariah 12. Verse 10. Zechariah's prophesy says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn. So, very interesting because what this verse is telling us is there is going to be a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Jewish people just before the Lord returns. Just notice it says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. I will pour on them a out Holy Spirit. So when people say, will the Holy Spirit be work operating on the earth during the tribulation? Yeah, look at this. Here's one more reference. Right, Just before the Lord returns, there is going to be a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the nation of Israel, on the Jewish people. God said, I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, the grace and prayer. Then, so after that outpouring, then they will see the one whom they have pierced. 
just like what he said here, Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, the Jewish people. Oh, they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. So that phrase, they will look on me whom they pierced, Zechariah 12, 10, is referenced here in Revelation 1, 7. They will see the one whom they appears. So you can imagine what's happening with the Jewish people. There's, they're going to experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit during the tribulation. They're going to have this awareness that, you know, we rejected the Messiah, and this is the Messiah we're going to see. And they're going to see him come, the one whom they appears. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. So the news, uh, you know, the Lord's coming. Um, the people, nations of the earth, the tribes of the earth, not just the Jewish people, the tribes of the people all across the earth. You know, the, those who have rejected Jesus, uh, they're going to mourn. They have rejected him. It's too late now. Right? So... The book of Revelation begins with that grand finale in mind. Verse 8, again, continuing more about this Jesus. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, very interesting. The same phrase was used about God the Father. Yeah, in verse 4, from him who from who is, who was, is to come. The same phrase is being used for the eternal word, Jesus Christ. I'm Alpha, Omega, the beginning, the end, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. So somebody said, Jesus never said he is God. Well, right here, look, 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 Revelation 1.8. Jesus is speaking. He is saying about himself i'm alpha omega beginning and the one who is who was who is to come the almighty did jesus say he's god right here one of the references he called himself the almighty who is the almighty god so keep in mind this thing keep this keep this thought in mind the bible talks about the triune god the godhead Every person of the Godhead is fully God. Many times in our minds we think or we imply, we may not say it in those words, but we think Jesus is one-third God, Holy Spirit is one-third God. But no, 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 no. Jesus is fully God. The Holy Spirit is fully God. God the Father is fully God. All the God the Father is, and the Holy Spirit is, is fully expressed through the Son or the Eternal Word. So every person of the Godhead fully embodies, fully expresses the Godhead. No person of the Godhead is partially God. No, no, no. Fully God. So God in three persons, every person of the Godhead is fully God. So that's why Jesus is saying, I'm Alpha, Omega, beginning, ending, who is, who was, or is to come, the Almighty. Fully God. The other thing to keep in mind, when he says, I'm Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, what he's really telling us is, that he is dwelling outside of time and God is in the eternal now. For God, there is no past, present, and future because outside of time, there is no past, present, and future. There's only one eternal now. And outside of time, he's at the beginning and the ending at that same instant. So when he says, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, we have a beginning and ending, the earth. But for God, he is at the beginning and at the ending, 
at the same moment. He's in the eternal now. That's why he's God. He's omnipresent in time and space. That means he's present everywhere in space. He's also present everywhere in time. At the beginning and at the ending. The ending for us is yet to come. He's already at the ending. He already sees the ending. It's already there for him. He's in the eternal now. So he's the Alpha, the Omega. The beginning and the end. We are yet to go to the end, but he's already there at the end. He is at the ending. Because he's outside of time. He's the Almighty. So, Jesus has introduced himself. Now, John is seeing this Jesus. Let's read, please, uh, the rest of chapter 1, verses 9 to uh, 20 till the end. Uh, maybe we can read three verses each. Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 to 20. John is seeing Jesus. Three verses each, please. I, John, brought your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesians, to Semana, to Pergamos, to Tyretria, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. Amen. He had in his right hand seven stars. Sorry. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, and the seven stars. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, let's look at these verses. Verse 9. So now John is introducing himself. So he has introduced God the Father, God the Spirit, the eternal word, the Lord Jesus, the now. So, okay, I John. So I said, John, now John is writing. I'm your brother and I'm your companion in tribulation. So I am also, so John is you know, saying, hey, I'm also going through all of this 
persecution, tribulation. I'm part of the kingdom. Patience of Jesus Christ is this endurance that we are put, you know, demonstrating for the sake of Jesus Christ. And he tells where he is. I was on the island of Patmos because he was he was banished there for the sake of Jesus, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. Remember, we we, we looked at that phrase, the testimony of Jesus. He was he was giving testimony to Jesus. Verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. So he's saying on the Lord's day, the Lord's day, interesting the phrase, the Lord's day in the New Test in, in the New Testament times eventually came to mean the first day of the week, the Lord's day, because that was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. So it became designated as the Lord's Day. So when we say the Lord's Day, it's giving reference to the fact that on the first day of the week, the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead. And from then on, the early church began to gather together for worship and so on on the Lord's Day. So John is saying, on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, what happened to me? I was caught up in the spirit. So this is being caught up in the spirit is an act of God. Meaning it's not like I or you can press some buttons and we can, you know, just jump out of this physical body and get into the spirit. Now we know that we can pray in the spirit. We can be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit and all of that. But this is not something we do at our will, right? It's something God causes. Just like what, what happened to Paul, right? So if you just cross-reference, we'll come back to Revelation 1, but just cross-reference, Second Corinthians chapter 12. Paul writes, right? He says, Second Corinthians verse 12, and I'll, and I'll just read those uh, first six verses. Second Corinthians 12 verses, sorry, we'll, we'll read the first four verses. It is Second Corinthians 12 verses 1 to 4. Paul writes, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, Paul is ref talking about his own experience here, but he's putting it in the third person, trying to be a little humble. Uh, he said, he's old. But he says, I know a man, he's referring to himself. I know such a person. And in this experience, he couldn't tell, like, was it in the body, out of the body? Meaning it was so surreal. To him, it seemed like he was in the body. It's like, hey, this is a real thing. And yet it was a spiritual experience. Of course, it's a vision and revelation, a spiritual experience. But it was so real. He's saying, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. It's like as though my whole being was taken up into heaven caught up there but we know that you know when you look, read it Ezekiel's experience as well uh, the body is here in the spirit he's caught up into heaven and uh, he's experiencing the spiritual realm he and God is giving him revelation or information in this manner so going back to Revelation chapter 1 Verse 10, John says, I was in the spirit. So his body is here on earth, but his inner person, spirit and soul, is taken into the spiritual realm. And what we can see here is that in the spiritual realm, there is sound. 
there is also a sense of direction because he says i heard behind me sense of direction that means the sound is coming from behind so obviously there's a sense of direction there is forward backward right so he says i heard behind me a loved voice sound so that means in the spirit world we are getting some insight about the spiritual world in the spiritual world there is communication happening sound there is a sense of direction behind me and then john is relating that experience to what he is uh, knows from the earth he says that sound is like the sound of a trumpet he knows trumpet from the earth like trumpet i you know he heard the sound of a trumpet so what he is hearing in the spiritual realm what he can do is he can only relate it back to things on the earth so the sound it sounds like a trumpet but the point i want us to understand that is that in the spiritual world there is a sense of direction there is sound there is these these are realities in the spiritual realm we can see right now how does that sound travel now on the earth we know uh sound is transmitted it's traveling through the medium of uh, this air the vibrations that happen uh so in the spiritual realm how does sound travel it doesn't have to it doesn't need the medium of of air or vibration i don't know how it travels but there is sound and it probably is tra traveling without a physical medium right somehow that sound is is, is being transmitted he's hearing this voice was loving and he's and the lord jesus is introducing himself he's saying i am alpha and omega the first the last so this is the same jesus who spoke earlier and then he's giving john instruction what you see right in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in asia and he mentions the name of the seven churches now notice what he's saying what you see right in a book how was that going to be possible i don't know i'm imagining this that john is in the spirit he's caught up to the heavens he's 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 he's, he's, he's he, his spirit is operating in the spiritual realm he's hearing and seeing but the lord jesus saying john right so did was he simultaneously writing or did he come back after this experience and then write we don't know but i'm making an assumption that because there is so much of information i don't know whether you know john had this whole experience then came down and he sat down for the next one week and wrote everything down i don't know or was it that while he's having a spiritual experience in heaven at the same time somehow in his body he's sitting here sitting at his desk or wherever he would have been sitting with that scroll in front and a ink pot and a feather pen and he's writing i don't know whether it's happening simultaneously or whether it happened you know afterwards we don't know but if it was happening simultaneously it's amazing that means his spirit and soul is encountering all this in the spiritual world and at that same instant through his physical body he is sitting here and he's writing you know and, and and it's a laborious work right those it's not as quickly as you can type on with the computer with thing and if you make mistakes you can you know you can just delete and all that no no writing on a scroll is a very laborious work so you know he probably had a 
scroll in front of him and pen and I mean this this ink pot and whatever and he's I don't know how he, how he did it or if he wrote it later on it had to be a supernatural work because he had to remember everything he saw and all the words that were spoken he had to remember all of that uh, supernaturally by the spirit and write everything down so we don't know exactly how it happened but either way it was a supernatural thing you know and uh, but the Lord sees Jesus said what was love what you see write in a book and then send it to the seven churches that means Either that one scroll was shared among them, most likely, or he had to make seven copies, which would have taken a lot of time, and he would have sent it to each one of these churches. Now, let's quickly look at the map. I think uh, in the PDF there's a little map there, which I will just share to you know for us just to look at the location of these seven churches. So here you can see it. Um, this is the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, this is the modern day west coast of turkey and he's on the island of patmos tiny little island here patmos he is banished there and here you see the seven churches ephesus this is the church place where you know paul came and the apostle paul uh, he established the church here and he actually spent about you know more than three years uh, in his third missionary journey paul was here in ephesus and while he was in Ephesus, he mentored, he nurtured a lot of the younger leaders who became future leaders of the church. It is very likely that while Paul was here for about a little over three years uh, during his third missionary journey at Ephesus, that these other churches were planted. So he must have trained these leaders, sent them here. Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. He, he would have sent them and you know, all these other churches were planted. Remember, during his first missionary journey, Paul actually wanted to minister in Asia. He actually wanted to go and preach here, but the Holy Spirit said no. And he had a vision, uh, sorry, in a second missionary journey, not the first one, uh, second missionary journey. He wanted to minister here. Uh, Holy Spirit said no. You go over the Mediterranean. So he, from the island, from Troas, he set sail over to Mediterranean on the other uh, other side and then you know he went down this whole region on on the side was Thessalonica down to Corinth uh, and so on so in a second missionary journey he spent his time here uh, and uh, it was only during his third missionary journey the Holy Spirit allowed him to come to Ephesus and from Ephesus Asia was reached right? this part of Asia was reached the seven churches so they all pretty close to each other. Many of them must have, you know, had leaders who were trained by the Apostle Paul. Paul's ministry definitely, you know, influenced all of these churches. And before Paul, uh, you know, Paul went to Rome. Uh, uh, sorry, Paul was in Rome for about two years and he was released briefly. He came and he appointed Timothy as the bishop of Ephesus. So really, Timothy was a leader in the church at Ephesus and then Paul went on to Rome and where he was beheaded around AD 68. Now, Revelation being written around AD 95, almost 30 years, almost 30 years, not entirely, but almost 30 years after Paul has been beheaded. So 30 years have gone. So we don't know if Timothy is still the leader at Ephesus, or Timothy by this time must have been quite elderly. He may have handed over the leadership to somebody else. Uh, so we don't know exactly whether Timothy is still the bishop here or uh, the transition has happened. And, you know, um, some say that Timothy uh, also was sent to jail uh, for his faith and so on. So we don't know. But Paul definitely had a great influence in the church in Ephesus. Timothy was the bishop for, appointed by Paul. But this is now almost 30 years after that. So uh, we are not very sure if Timothy is still the
a leader there or he has handed it off to somebody. Right? So going back to uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, the Lord Jesus said, telling John, John, write and send it to these seven churches. Now, I see a question here. Uh, John, John's question is, would there be any reason God is addressing these seven churches particularly? There is no reason given here, uh, but this is just a personal opinion. I feel that the Apostle John, who is very elderly now, must have had influence in this region. So remember John, uh, the other apostles were all based in Jerusalem, right? So that's quite south, far away from. But John has been banished to Patmos, and Patmos is close to these seven churches. It's possible that, and 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 and, and we don't know. We don't have a record of this. It's possible that the leaders from these seven churches would have in some way connected with John, reached out to John, or you know, some connection. Which means that John, the beloved apostle, has some influence in these seven churches. And so the Lord is telling him right to these churches. So that's one, again, I'm just saying it's my, there's, there's no chapter and verse to prove what I'm saying. I'm just, I'm just trying to think because usually that's how God works, right? He works through uh, what he has given to us and he says, okay, you, you know, you, you write to these people. So most likely these were churches that John had influence over through those leaders. They would pay attention to what John says. So the Lord is saying, send the message to them. That's one reason. But also, a second reason, again, there's no chapter and verse for this, but I'm just thinking that it's one way of multiplying the message that what is given in the book of Revelation, John, I'm giving it to you. So don't just keep it to yourself. Get it out to the closest church, a set of churches, seven churches are really close to you. Get it out to them, multiply the message that there's no way that this book of Revelation is going to get lost. You know, it would have come to those churches. Could be possible that they would have either had their own copies or made their own copies of this epistle from John. That, that the message is multiplied, it's preserved, and it can be then passed on. So these are two thoughts I have, and, I, and, I, and I, we can't back it up either from history or uh, from chapter and verse, but this is what I think, right? So, verse 12. John, remember this is all a spiritual experience, like in the spirit, he turns to see the voice that spoke with me. So there's a sense of direction. There is also perception, just like the natural world. John is operating in the spiritual. He's turning to see. Right? Where is this? Who's this? Who's speaking? I know this voice is coming from behind me. Who's speaking? He turns around. And uh, then he sees. And it's very interesting what he sees. Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. So he's seeing seven lampstands. Now, John is Jewish. For him, the lampstand represents what's inside the temple. So, lampstand. What is it? Old Testament? In the holy place, there's the lampstand. There is a table of showbread, there is the altar of incense, and there is a lampstand. Three pieces 
inside the holy place. There's the outer court, the inner court, and the most holy place. In the inner court or the holy place, there are three things. There is the table of showbread, there is the altar of incense, and there is the lampstand. The lampstand is the only source of light inside the inner court or the holy place. That's because there's a thick curtain that, that used to separate the the outer court from the inner court. So they had the lampstand, that was the only source of light, and it was with that light the the the, the high priest would you know replace the showbread and he would trim the altar of incense with that light, meaning the bread and the the uh, the altar of incense had to be maintained with that light. Now he is seeing in heaven lampstand. He is seeing seven lampstands. And what does each lampstand represent? We see in verse uh, twenty, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So now the Lord Jesus is assigning a meaning. For John, lampstand is something associated with the temple, the tabernacle, and then the temple. Now the Lord Jesus saying, John, I'm giving a new meaning to this. The lampstand, each one of the seven lampstands, they are representing one of the seven churches, local Christian communities beautiful picture so a local church is a lampstand so there is some correlation or some connection we can say you know lampstand the old testament what purpose did it serve it gave light in order for the for the bread and for the incense to be taken care of local church what should it do it should give light a revelation for the word of god and for prayer and worship, that's you know represented by the altar of incense. The word of the local church brings that revelation, brings that illumination, and it's a place that through which the word of God and the altar of incense, which is prayer and worship, can take place. Right. So um, for John, this is, becomes very significant. The lampstand used in the temple is being used to represent a local church. Right, so there is meaning to all of that. Okay, let's pause here. Uh, we are we're stopping with verse twelve. Uh, I'll try to go a little fast, otherwise we'll, we won't finish the book of Revelation. But uh, there's so much of meaning uh, uh, here. But we'll we'll pick up speed next next week. Could somebody please uh, close in prayer and then we will get ready for the next class. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for these words that we are learning. And we pray, O oh God, that you would help us to understand better every week and help us to really uh, fix this in our eyes, O oh God, and to uh, have a grip of uh, this beautiful prophetic books, O oh God. We pray that you would minister to us as we go forward and help us to remember this all the days of our lives. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye now.